Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the songs we have sung this morning that speak of our life in Christ, the forgiveness that we have because he died for us on the cross and he rose from the dead. And by simple faith, we have grace abundantly supplied to us and life eternal and life abundant now. What a simple message, profound, and yet we sometimes take it for granted. We give you praise for it this morning, and we ask that during the short minutes that we have together, your spirit would inform us and transform us. And I pray especially, Lord, this morning, if there are those sitting in chairs in this room right now that have not accepted and welcomed that forgiveness, that this would be the day, a great day for them. And if there are those in this room who are bound by sin and have not confessed it and are in some kind of misery because of it, may this be the day that they are set free. Thank you for your words. Speak to us now. We pray it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Psalm 32. Psalm 32, would you turn there, please? We are um, a Bible church, and so when we come to the pulpit, whoever's preaching here, we preach from God's Word and we open it up. And one of the things that we do when we open up God's Word is we stand because this is the time that we know for certain that God is speaking to us. So would you stand, uh, whatever format you have of God's Word, whether it's uh, paper or electronic. Please give attention to the reading reading of Psalm 32, the Word of God. A Psalm of David, a maskil. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity. I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of grave waters they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include the bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness, shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Simple question this morning for you. Are you forgiven? You know, the the Christian life begins and ends with forgiveness. Um, Are you in a right relationship with the God of the universe, having your sins forgiven? It's a big question this morning for not only if you are a Christian, but if you are not a Christian. But if you are a Christian, it's still the question because David is talking to believers here, application for those who don't know Jesus Christ. 
But for, forgiveness is the foundation of the Christian life. Think about it. Everything we do and are springs from the act that God has forgiven us. Isn't that right? We, where, where do we start the Christian life? Forgiveness. And then once we have this forgiveness, we have this ongoing life of forgiveness. We are to live the forgiven life. And that's what David, David describes here as the joy of of living the forgiven life. So are you forgiven? But two more questions. How do you know? And what difference does it make in your life that you are forgiven? I mean, is it just, okay, well, I get going to heaven when I die? Or is there some impact that it has on today when you leave here, the rest of the, your morning, the rest of your week, the rest of your life, that your sins are forgiven? Or is it just, yeah, I'm a Christian, I go to church once a week, and yada, yada, yada. What is the impact of having your sins totally forgiven? I think we'll see the answer to that. You saw the answer as we read it. I think you can kind of think back and go, yeah, those questions have been answered. We'll bring it forward into the New Testament because it's fulfilled in Christ this is a psalm of David, still in the first book of Psalms. Um, it is called a maskil. You see though that, that superscription at the top of your, your, your passage of, uh, in your Bible. It says a psalm of David, a maskil. A maskil is like a contemplative poem, something you kind of think about. It's a, it was to be sung. And um, maskil comes from one of the Hebrew words for... Uh, for instruction, for wisdom. And so this is often thought of as an instructional, contemplative poem. It's contemplative because you notice the, the word selah that happened three times. That word selah means it's a, a musical interlude. If you were singing this, it would be a kind of, a, okay, the instruments are going to play for a while. Why? So you'll think about what was just said. Take a moment to ponder the words that were just sung to you or spoken by you or sung by you and so, Selah means take a moment to think about it, the truth, the depth, the magnitude of what has just been said. And we see it after verses 1 through 4, Selah, after verse 5, Selah, after verses 6 and 7, Selah, that's the heart of it, to ponder and to think about this morning. So this was a contemplative poem written by David. We don't know when he wrote it. Some scholars think that maybe this was at the time of uh, his sin with Bathsheba. It's very similar in format to Psalm 51 when David did write about his sin with Bathsheba. And it's similar that way. So it's often called a penitential psalm. Not that he was in a penitentiary when he wrote it. But the idea of penitence, repentance, seeking forgiveness a psalm about forgiveness and the joy of forgiveness. And so that's what we come to this morning. And that's the first thing we see in verses 1 and 2. Forgiveness of sins brings great joy. And you saw, as we read it, he big begins and he ends with joy, doesn't he? He begins with the joy of, of having your sins forgiven, and he ends with the joy of having your sins forgiven. It's, it's a grateful psalm at the beginning and the end. But in the middle, it gets a little trying. But he begins with, the forgiveness of sins brings great joy. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, meaning the same thing. It's a, remember, that we're, this is Hebrew poetry. This is a parallelism. Those two ideas together, your, your sins being forgiven and covered, it's the same thing. They're done away with. It's not, it's not just covered over, but they're done away with. Your sins are they're gone. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. In other words, he's not going to hold you to account. He's not keeping track anymore. There's no uh, cleric up in heaven who's marking sins. That's the idea. He's not doing that. Done. You need to embrace that truth that it is you are forgiven if you are a believer in Christ and he does not impute that sin to you. In fact... In the New Testament, we are justified by faith, which means what he credits to our account is not sin, but he credits to our account the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
So he not only takes away your sin, and it's gone forever, but he pl- in, in place of that, he puts the righteousness of Jesus. Wow. That is salvation. That is forgiveness. That's what it means to be a Christian. That is justification by faith. You have been declared a judicial pronouncement to be righteous in the sight of God because Christ died and rose again and he clothes you with the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. Your sin is gone forever. Amen? Amen. Gone. That's why he says, how blessed is this one? The, The Holman Christian Standard Version puts it this way. How joyful is the one who knows that their sin is forgiven. And my point is, We need to be joyful. We forget sometimes. I mean, yeah, I'm a Christian. Come to to worship together. We should come with joyful singing. Why? Because we are the redeemed of the Lord. And our sins have been wiped away, and he's given us in place of sin and death and punishment, he's given us Christ and his life and his righteousness and his purity and his love and his grace and his mercy. So David's sin is not being held, he's not being held to account, he's free from it. And that freedom brings him deep joy. Your identity is not in your deficiencies. That's not who you are. Your identity is in your forgiveness, and that's what what David is saying. His identity is not in what is deficient in him, but it's in what has been taken away. His deficiencies have been taken away. His sin is gone, and in that he is full of of great joy and thanksgiving. Notice the last part of verse 2, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. In other words, we can't hide our sin from God. We have to be completely honest with him if we're going to be forgiven. And the idea is that this complete honesty brings this uh, kind of the transition to the next point that we're going to see, see that, um, that when we are not completely honest with God about our sin, there is misery because there is no forgiveness, because we're holding back. But he says the one who comes to God with total honesty and says, Lord, I'm an open book, Yep, that was wrong. Yep, that was wrong, and so was that, and that, and that, and that. And I'm not holding anything back. It's gone, and there's joy. Blessed is that one. Doesn't, when he says he and the man, he means the woman too, okay? All of us. But if we hold back, and he's, uh, then there's misery. And he's going to give us, in the, in the second part of it, he says, this, blessed is the man who's forgiven. And now he's going to talk about the process of how this forgiveness happens and how it happened in a specific case for him. And it may be that it was his uh, sin with Bathsheba. We know that it was uh, nearly a year before Nathan came to, to David and said, David, uh, guess what? You're the man. You blew it. And God knows about it. So for almost a year... He kept that sin hidden. But in verses 3 through 5, we're going to see the cure for guilt is the confession of sin. You're going to see this process, how the Lord chastens David. He says this, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long, holding back sin, hiding sin brings misery to our lives. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah. Which means, okay, take a minute and think about that. Are you there? Are you holding back? Are you in misery? Because of your sin. Is there something you just will not fess up to before God? Why would someone not do that? Why would someone not want the joy that he's speaking of in verses 1 and 2? Why would someone choose misery? I don't know. There's, there's some sick way in which some people like to be miserable. You know them? Yeah. 
But really, when it comes down to it, why would someone not confess its pride, isn't it? Isn't it pride? That you, I'm just, um, and so what causes the misery here from David? Somebody say the word. Sin. Pride. Me. Not God. It's not God causing the misery here, is it? It's David. It's me. It's my own pride. It's my own unwillingness, my own stubbornness to say, yep, God, you're right and I'm wrong. He says this, um, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Some, uh, it literally says, my, my bones were brittle. This is a Hebrew poetry, which is a way of saying his entire being, everything about him. He may have had some physical malaise. He may have felt sick. He may have been sick. He was mentally sick. He was physically sick. He was spiritually sick. He was emotionally sick. He was spiritually depressed. He was down. He was sad. He was, he was out of it because of what? Sin. And that's what kept him down and in misery. And sometimes it even affects our physical body. We become sick because we are sin sick. And remember, here he's talking about Christians because David is a Christian. Well, we wouldn't say the word Christian. He's a believer. And he's talking to other believers. So he's talking to us. There is an application for unbelievers, and we'll get to that. But when David kept silent about his sin, the result was some, court, some sort of malaise in all of his life, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. And in verse 4, he says, For day and night... Your hand was heavy upon me. What is that all about? I want God's hand on me. You know what? I want his hand of blessing upon me. This is a different kind of hand, isn't it? This is chastisement. This is a loving hand of God saying, my son, you need to repent. This is God's heavy hand. He is heavy-handed. At this point, but it is a loving hand, isn't it? He only wants joy for David. He wants joy for you, and if his heavy hand is on you, it's because he wants the best for you. He wants you to experience the abundance of the joy of salvation and the joy of forgiveness and being free from the misery that you're in because you've chosen sin and chosen to hide it. So what holds you back? You know what? What is hidden has power over you. It doesn't matter how long it, ago it happened. Whether it was yesterday or 20 years ago, still sin. Time doesn't change the fact 40 minutes or 40 years ago, if there's something that you did not own up to as sin and it is causing you misery, these 10, 15 20, 30, 40, 50 years, it's time to say finally to God, I was wrong. Set me free through Jesus. It's, I don't need that misery anymore. Set me free. But as long as it's hidden, it's got power over you. And that's what David is saying. There was this, this it was sapping the very life out of him, like being out in the middle of a desert with no no shade and nothing to drink and you've sweat everything out and you're just sapped of strength. You've been there spiritually? Have you been there in your life where you're just sapped and depressed and tired and you have no um, energy and nothing to go on and it may be because of you. Sometimes it's because of me. It's not because of God because God's hand is a loving hand. And in David, it was his own sin. So why not confess? Why not just say, okay, I want to get it, get it done? Well, we convince ourselves it wasn't sin. We talk ourselves into, well, it wasn't that bad. I'm saved, so I'm in God's grace, so you know, I don't really need to own up to it. Or it wasn't my fault, or I had every right, or I didn't know what I was doing, or I was so young at the time, or I really meant well, you know, we have all the things that we can say that will convince ourselves that something that we've done that is yesterday or last week or sometime in the past just needs to lay there. I don't want to deal with it. Why not just confess it and be free? 
Because, you see, we need to be sensitive to sin. That's the, what the Christian life is, is where we are sensitive to the fact that God, uh, that whenever we sin, we uh, offend a holy God. So for David, his vitality was drained from him, just like the fever of the heat of summer, because holding back sin brings misery. But, okay, that's the bad news. The good news, again, in verse 5, confessing sin brings forgiveness. That's the cure for guilt. You feel guilty? You know why we feel guilty sometimes? We're guilty. And the cure for guilt is confession of sin, to get it out of the way. That's the cure for guilt. He said, notice the simplicity of verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I didn't hide anymore. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Think about it. Ponder that for a minute. How utterly simple it is. I'm not going to hide it anymore. I'm going to agree with God I was wrong. I'm going to confess it to him as sin and then guess what? The guilt is gone. Pretty simple, huh? That's the gospel message, too. I mean, that's, and we live out the gospel message over and over and over again, not just when we're saved, but throughout the rest of our life. But when we confess our sin, it brings about a freedom from the guilt. Why would you feel guilty over something you did 20 years ago if Christ has died for it and you've already confessed it? Why would you feel guilty over sin that has been taken care of? Blessed is the man whose sin is taken away. There's joy, not depression and misery and all that garbage. There's joy in having our sins forgiven. And again, the only reason would be pride to not, because I was right. Hmm. So David confesses his sin acknowledges it, says, I'm not going to hide any more from you, God. It's, it's useless, it's pointless. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. That last phrase is, wow. And, and I know that, that there are many people here today that if you just knew you were forgiven, you'd be free. You just accept that truth. If you would just finally believe it, no, you don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. None of us do. That's the point, isn't it? We're all the same. We're all in the same boat. None of us deserve to be forgiven. That's why we need to be forgiven. That's what it's all about. And I know that there are people in here today that just feel like, oh, I'm just so... You focus on your deficiencies, and the deficiencies are removed in, in Christ, and you're set free. Be that. Accept that this morning. He wants you to be joyful. I want you to be joyful, but, uh, but this is what this psalm is about. Why choose misery when you can choose joy? So, very simply, you know, David kept silent. Kept silent. But God pursued him with that heavy hand. David responded to the chastisement, and he confessed his sin, and God forgave. And that's the pattern for our life as well. It's very, very simple. Simple message. God's truths and, and the solutions to our problems are oftentimes very simple. Do you know that? We want to make them very complex. Some, I know there, there, there are things in our lives that are very, very, very complex. It's hard to work through some things. And we want to com complicate things, and the world wants to complicate our problems. You know, there must be some reason that you are so broken, and it's going to take years to figure it out. It might take just a moment to just let go of what has broken you and to be free. And it can change you in a moment. It changed me in a moment, honestly. I was broken, very, very broken. I was an in, insomniac. And even, I'm not going to ask if you've ever had any trouble with insomnia when I was a young man before I came to Christ, and I was under the conviction of sin. I thought I was going to die every night. 
I could not sleep. And this went on for several years. And the day, the night that I accepted Christ as my Savior, I honestly, I swear to God, I slept like a baby for the first time in years because I knew my sin was gone, completely gone. And I had that assurance of being free and I was not going to be judged for my sin, but I was accepted as a child of God. And he gave us, he gives us this grace. You know, we live in a, in a no-fault world, and we want to find fault somewhere else, and sometimes the fault is with us. And, but grace isn't absolving us of our responsibility. Grace is granting forgiveness when we take responsibility. So grace isn't saying, well, you're not responsible for your sin. No, it's we're saying you're responsible for your sin, but he's going to take it away. And when we, when we recognize that we are responsible for our brokenness, then we're making progress. Then we're in the good place of humility where we are ready to accept that forgiveness that he offers to us. And the result is freedom and joy in the psalm. He begins with joy, he ends with joy. But he's not done, and he, and he talks more about a, a lesson for us in verses 6 and 7, and the result of this forgiveness where we see that a, a timely confession of sin is going to bring rescue and refuge. It has to be timely when we confess our sins, and when we do that, he's going to rescue us, and there's a place of safety and protection. He says in verse 6, Therefore, let everyone, he's talking, he's talking then to the congregation, let everyone who is godly, he's talking about believers here, pray to you in a time when you may be found. I like the New English translation that says, pray to him while there is a window of opportunity. You know what that means? There is a shrinking window of opportunity, O Christian, when he is chastising you, that window of opportunity is when his hand is upon you. God is patient and he is gracious, but he will by no means clear the guilty. Which means we could end up in a place where we have hardened our hearts and we find ourselves on the outs of joy for years because we didn't respond at the timely moment. But today, if you're hearing his, his voice, Psalm 95 says this, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do you hear his voice? If your heart is hardened, hear it today. Let him break your heart. That you might find the joy and the forgiveness that he has for you. Because you want to be free from <clears throat> the guilt and the misery, and you want to have the great joy of forgiveness. Notice what he says in verse 6, he says, Let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found, which we think might be any time, but there's this shrinking uh, window of opportunity. He says, Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. What he means, there's a picture here of a flood. You've seen the floods in Texas. Do not ever underestimate the power of water. And if you are caught in a flood and it sweeps you away, and he's talking here about the heavier hand of God, you will not be able to stand. And, and you may become hard, and it may end up a l years of hardness where you have no joy. But today, if you hear his voice, do not. Today is the day to respond. So in this case, the one who is silent about their sin doesn't respond to the chastisement that comes from the Lord, and they may find themselves in a no-win situation from which there, there's no turning back until they're finally broken in a very badly way. And we don't want that for you. We want God's heavy hand to result in his mercy and his joy. And he applies this then to himself in verse 7 where he says, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. He thinks about how I, I, I responded at the right time. And what happened was you enclosed me and, and I'm, I'm, I'm no longer hiding my sin, but I'm hiding in you. 
And now you're preserving me. There's more than just, okay, you're forgiven. There's a clerical thing in heaven. No, you, you keep me from trouble. You keep me from the misery and the things that could happen because of my sin. You, you've kept me from my very self. And you surround me with shouts of deliverance. There's this joy. And so when we respond and we confess our sins, we are rescued from that and we find our refuge in him. Selah, he says. Consider the lesson. Think about it. What do you want? Misery or joy? Blessings of joy. You want a, a cleansed spirit. You want forgiveness. You want safety and security and preservation from trouble or the misery that sin brings. The last part of the psalm is the instructional part because a masculine is a contemplative poem that teaches something. And in it, <clears throat> we are urged to surrender to his grace. Verse 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon, upon you. This is the Lord. He says, okay, I got a lesson for you. You better listen. My eye is upon you. I'm going to teach you some, some things that you need to know. Verse 1, don't be stubborn. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, like a dumb animal, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. So this animal that will not be trained, and in, in, in you take the bit and bridle off, some of you who do horses, sometimes, sometimes they just don't get it, right? Or they don't get it yet. And, and we, should, we shouldn't have to be under bit and bridle. He wants us to come willingly. That's the idea. Don't be stubborn. Don't hide your sin. Give in. Surrender. Like an animal that is broken and finally submits to his master. So that across the corral you go, and they come. Willingly. Because they love you. God is gracious and he gives this promise. But it comes with the warning, the don't be stubborn like a dumb animal. So the believer, must we confess our sins only when things are desperate? Only when things get at their worst? Do we wait until then to say, okay, I give? We should do it on a daily basis. Every day we should pray, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. In other words, every day we should say, Lord, what have I hidden? What have I done? What have I said? What have I felt? Where is my sin that I may be free from it today and not hiding from you? We can avoid the misery of unconfessed sin by daily confessing to him. Then he says in verse 10, Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. We can avoid that misery of unconfessed sin by embracing the Lord's loyal love. The loving kindness is God's loyal love. It's the relationship that a believer has. We enter into a covenant relationship with him. When, whenever David talks about, or the Old Testament, about God's loving kindness, his unfailing love, that means it's for believers who are in a relationship with him. And he's saying, surrender and embrace that, that, that relationship that you have. And it is ongoing because it surrounds you. It's not just, okay, a, flip, a switch in heaven is flipped. No, his grace and his forgiveness surrounds you every day and it protects you and leads you and guides you wherever you go. And it brings safety and security. And so, and then he ends in verse 11, the way he began, with rejoicing. He says, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. That's how he began the psalm. Blessed is the one whose, forgive, whose sins are forgiven. Be glad, and that is an instruction to us, a call to us, for us to rejoice, those of us who know him. Now, I have three simple things for you at the end here. The first is this. <clears throat> those who experience forgiveness are to proclaim forgiveness. Forgiveness. 
Why are we here? Why is Valley Bible Church here? We have a message of freedom and grace and mercy and forgiveness. We're to tell the world, you can be free. You can have your sins forgiven. That is our message, isn't it? And those who have been forgiven should proclaim that forgiveness. We all have a responsibility to proclaim that message of forgiveness. If it is just telling someone, you know what, I'm a Christian and I can't do that, or I'm a Christian and I'll pray for you, or I'm a Christian, would you like to come to church with me? I'm a Christian, can, I, can, can we get together and talk? Whatever level of involvement, that, but that you are thinking about people that you come in contact with, who are you praying for right now for salvation? Do you have a list of people? Do you have a list of people that you're thinking about and praying for? for? Evangelism is not just my job. It's our job. We who are the redeemed should say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Not just on Sunday morning, but where you work and where you live. And we, that's what we're about as a church, is proclaiming that forgiveness. We are to bring people to Christ, and we are to bring them to maturity. That's the Great Commission. We're pretty good at the maturity part. We can do better at the bringing them to Christ. But that's our job. You, we can't make disciples without disciples, right? And where do you start? Right there. Cross of Christ. And we do all things for the sake of the gospel. Second thing for you this morning is this. And we go back to one of the questions at the very beginning. If you are forgiven, what difference does that make in your life? What difference does it make if you are forgiven? In your bulletins this morning, you'll see something I've given out before. It's called Morning Affirmations. And I encourage you to take that and, and use it in your devotional life. I pray through this once a week. I have other things that I do, but I pray through this one once a week. But there's a section of this that has captured me the last few weeks. And it is the, uh, um, the section, that, verse, uh, section four that says, My identity in Christ. And I'll show it on the screen. On the screen. It says this. Again, I've just been, this has been rattling through my brain and my heart for the last few weeks. Galatians 2.20. Christian, this is you. And you should rehearse this and think about this. Selah. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in this flesh, I live by faith. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Okay, I've got forgiveness of sins, but you know what that means? I have forgiveness from the penalty of sin because Christ died for me. Yes, you are forgiven. You're set free today. But you know what? You have freedom from the power of sin because you died with Christ. Think about that one. I have freedom from that dark power of of keeping things secret because I died with him. I is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And I have fulfillment for this day because Christ lives in me. Really. We talked about that last week. And everything in the temple says, what? Glory. And where is the temple now? Right here. Glory. But I have freedom from that power of sin, and I have fulfillment this day because Christ lives in me. And so, therefore, by faith, I will allow Christ to manifest his life through me. I encourage you this week to take that tool and pray through that this week and, and live, live that out. Make forgiveness a part of your life. It's not just, okay, I'm forgiven. I'll be reminded next week at church. Live it. Live it out. Live out that joy of forgiveness every single day this week. And the third thing this morning, and we go back to the original question, is this. Are you forgiven? And how do you know? Christian, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. 
Today is the day you can be set free if you, for, if you confess that to him this morning. Do you have old sins that are yet unconfessed that, that you, you know that maybe you need to go back and do something and make amends? I don't know. Do you have ongoing sin that you have not forsaken and you just will not say, I give, I surrender to your grace? Today's the day to do that. Is there bitterness in your life? Is there unforgiveness? You know what Jesus said? If you don't forgive them, I'm not going to forgive you. Because unforgiveness is a sin. And it will, it will keep you in bondage. So I want to take a Salem moment for some of you that may not, you may not have accepted this full forgiveness yet. And I'm going to put on the screen a basic statement of the gospel. Um, I'm going to let you have a sail a moment. Christian, I want you to think about what you may need to confess. But if you're here and maybe you haven't had this initial cleansing of sin where you've accepted Christ and he's forgiven all of your sin, um, you're not saved by a pray, prayer, for by grace you have been saved through faith and then not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest anyone should boast. So saying a prayer doesn't save you, but, is this, but does this in some way represent what is happening in your heart this morning? If so, we're going to take a moment of say lost silence, and I want you to look at that. Christian, if there's something between you and God or another person, no more misery, let go of it this morning, okay? Now let's take a moment of silence to think about this prayer if you need to accept him as your savior this morning. If you believe this this morning, you are free. I encourage you to accept that freedom and that forgiveness and that joy this morning. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and close us in their song.